Thank you all for joining us in this breakout session, which is entitled Influence of Individual Members of Congress on Agencies. The, um, the central um, question put before the, the panel today and that we hope we can have a conversation with you all in the audience about is essentially you have some believe that the administrative state is largely operating successfully as designed with important regulatory decisions being made by experts who have been insulated from politics. Among others, there is growing criticism of Congress's oversight of administrative agencies through the use of oversight hearings, formal document requests, and the power of the purse. Still others see outsized influence being exercised on an ad hoc basis by individual members of Congress, committee chairs and members, and even congressional and Senate staff themselves. So the question becomes, Given the relationship between the administrative agencies and Congress, is there often an opportunity for outsized influence by small numbers of congressmen and staff to gain the system? Well, that's sort of the question before us. I anticipate that our discussion today will be a broader one about oversight and the relationship between executive branch agencies, independent agencies, and the Congress in executing their oversight responsibilities. We have a really impressive uh, panel here today um, who have stream, extremely deep um, uh, experience in, the, um, in government, both in the uh, executive branch as well as the Congress. So I'd like to introduce them. And then after I do that, they'll speak for a few minutes and give their opening their remarks. And then we'll try to lead a discussion. And we'll try to make that as dynamic as possible. Definitely leave enough time for questions um, throughout the throughout the session. So our first panelist is James Miller, who is currently a senior advisor at Hush Blackwell. As you all probably know very well, he led OMB under President Reagan from 1985 to 1988. He was also the chairman of the FTC from 1981 to 85. He served as a member of the President's National Security Council, was head of Citizens uh, for a sound, e sound Economy from 88 to 2003, and earlier in, in his career led OMB's Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. We also have with us Alan Rawl. He is the founder and leader of Sidley Austin's Privacy, Data Security, and Information Law Practice. He previously served as Vice Chairman of the White House Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. He was OMB General Counsel, General Counsel of the Department of Agriculture, and associate counsel to the president. And our third panelist is Zachary Schramm. Zachary serves as staff director and chief counsel to ranking member Gary Peters on the subcommittee on federal spending oversight and emergency management. He also served previously as a senior advisor and investigations counsel at the Department of State as senior counsel to Senator Carl Levin on the permanent subcommittee on investigations and a counsel at Wilmer Hale. So with that, I'm going to leave it to the members uh, to make some opening remarks. And Jim, we're going to start with you. And if you'd like, you can stay at the, um, at the desk rather than coming to the dais. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. I think I'll sit right here. I'm honored to be here with a distinguished panel, particularly Alan Rawl, my old buddy from OMB days. And uh, I want to mention uh, Sue Braden, Judge Sue Braden out here with her law clerks, some of her law clerks. Welcome. Well, I'm a believer in agency accountability, but accountability to whom? When I was at the FTC with Sue, sometimes I thought I reported to 535 members of Congress plus the President of the United States. Other days, I thought, you know, as long as I keep my nose out of places where I shouldn't be, I didn't report to anybody. That, I submit, is very bad government. Accountability is very important. So what form should proper accountability take? With respect to the administration, and I'm talking about from the perspective of an agency, it's appropriate for administration to articulate policy direction for agencies and ultimate control over rulemaking. As I understand it, and Alan can kick me if I'm wrong, the President of the United States can tell the EPA administrator, I want the rule to come out this way, not that way. Perfectly legal and proper. And proper. 
You might not want to do it, it looks bad, bad press, et cetera, but you have the right to do that. With respect to Congress, you have the power to change laws with or without the president, uh, to uh, inquire of agencies what they're doing, et cetera, subpoenas if you, if you think that is necessary. Now, what form should uh, constitute improper accounting, accountability? Well, with the administration trying to intervene in quasi-judicial proceedings. And at the FTC, we have what's called part three, and those are basically adjudications of liability or non-liability. And it would be improper for a president or a president staff to intervene in that um, sort of thing. Now, let me give you some examples of my time from the FTC and, the, um, uh, and how I dealt with them. Um, and I'm sure everyone here has stories of how they dealt with these kinds of, of challenges. And keep in mind, if you're in that position, you're going to have these kind of challenges come up. Maybe not exactly like those I described, but challenges. When I was at the FTC, uh, there was an attempt by the Department of Justice to take over a case that, were, that would have almost certainly been under the rubric, uh, under the, um, uh, be assigned to the Federal Trade Commission under the joint DOJ and FTC agreements of the past. I simply refused. It really never came up to the level of the commission having a vote or something like that. Um, and if, if I had ever received a presidential directive about a rulemaking, though, I would have had two choices, go along or resign. Uh, should I have received a presidential directive in an adjudication, I would have refused. It never happened, but I would have refused. Now, with respect to Congress, after I went to the FTC, I got several calls from members of Congress to fix cases. Yes, it happens. That made me suspect, suspect that the practice had been routine, but not with me. I had good guidance from my general counsel before Alan, and uh, I knew that's not appropriate. Um, also, uh, I received calls uh, from the Hill to come up to the congressman or senator's office and meet with this person who was under investigation, a person that uh, uh, was the subject of an FTC adjudication, and solve the matter right then and there. And of course I said, no, I cannot do that. And occasionally they would call, they'd call the bureau director and say, come to my office and so forth. The bureau director came to me. I said, tell them that I refuse to let you go. And it didn't make me really popular on the Hill with a lot of people, but that was the appropriate response, I thought. Uh, now, if the, if the congressman, um, if I got a call from a member of Congress about specifically fixing a case, I would say, uh, I'm sure you are calling me to give me information, and I'll make a note about this in the record of the proceeding. Uh, usually that was enough. But if they were persistent, I'd say, Senator or Congressman, if I were to do that, we'd get mud on both our shoes, and neither of us wants that. Now, a redeeming thing about this is that I spoke with John Dingell, Chairman Dingell, and also Chairman Packwood, who was chairman of the Commerce Committee, about these challenges. And just to give them a heads up, you may hear some very sharp criticism from some of your colleagues about my refusal to be understanding or cooperative or whatever. Both of them were highly supportive of my refusals and positions. Now, two concluding thoughts. First, the Supreme Court's decision in the 1935 Humphreys executor case um, gives, I think, there's an impression, that gives members of Congress more latitude to, end quote, intervene, quote, with independent agencies than with than dependent agencies. They just, and it makes the agency more vulnerable because they don't have the protection of the presidency to go with it. Um, that may change. Um, I know Nino Scalia uh, told me in 
the late 70s, he thought that the Supreme Court existing at that time would likely overturn Humphrey's executive if given an opportunity. So I might be addressed that way. Second, most problems with Congress can be avoided by keeping them, keeping in touch, especially with the chairman of the oversight committees, the, uh, of the authorizing committees especially, giving them a heads up on major initiatives and in general maintaining transparency about what's going on in the agency. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you so much, Jim Allen. Thanks, and it's, uh, it's an honor to follow uh, Jim Miller, my uh, di very distinguished uh, former client uh, as uh, director of OMB, and it was uh, a uh, honor to serve as his uh, general counsel there. It's an honor to be on this distinguished panel. And keep and me out of trouble. <laughs> and in front of this, yeah, the statute of limitations, uh, I think, has run on all the matters that we worked on together at this point. Uh, and also to be uh, uh, sitting here in front of this uh, distinguished audience, including in addition to many of you and Judge Braden, but uh, former legal advisor at the State Department, Edward Williamson over there, who's trying to uh, uh, be in disguise. Um, but uh, so it's a, it's a pleasure to also, and, and a, uh, you know, a challenge to address the topic of the outside influence of individual members. Uh, some of the member, in, individual members with uh, power and influence and authority do so by virtue of their uh, position as committee chair. So that, you know, it's hard to uh, ascertain what is the individual influence, what's the, the, the influence of, the, uh, of the, the position. The role of the personality and particular uh, knowledge uh, and dynamism and uh, aggression uh, of the individual members, whether they be uh, chairman or um, ranking members or, or just members of the committee is, is also a factor. Uh, it seems like this topic is tailor-made for, for some anecdotes, uh, so I might as well uh, 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 share one that involves a uh, trip I took up to the Hill uh, uh, back in the day with uh, Jim Miller. I don't know if you remember this, Jim. I, I think you probably will. So the, we, this was a, a particularly uh, powerful member of the House. He was a committee chair. He was the chairman of the Appropriations <laughs> Committee, uh, which, of course, by uh, couldn't have more power, but also by virtue of his longevity, his personality, and the utterly incomprehensible nature of his speech. Chairman uh, uh, Witten, uh, uh, a very uh, respectable uh, uh, figure who's deceased now, uh, so this is uh, certainly not to, to speak ill of him at all, but to, to give an example of the respective views of, uh, uh, from the executive and, and from Congress, but uh, Jim and I went up there, so you may remember after President Reagan charged uh, Director of OMB to tell um, agencies that they should no longer treat the earmarks of congressional spending as uh, binding on them if uh, they, and that they should not comply with those uh, earmarked edicts in congressional reports that were not passed into legislation unless and except insofar as they, uh, they were consistent with the President's agenda. So uh, Director Miller issued, uh, dutifully issued a memorandum to all uh, agency heads and, and, and cabinet officers. And of course, the next thing was a summons to go up uh, to the Hill to meet with Mr. Witten, who, who uh, found that the practice of congressional earmarks, which is tucking in spending, which there's a yin and yang uh, in Washington over whether earmarks are uh, just how bad they are or if they're good at all, they're out of favor now, and I think that uh, public and influence, at least it, uh, for a while, has been to um, put the spending in, in the, the actual legislation. So Chairman Witten, in his uh, inimitable and, and unintelligible manner, uh, I think conveyed to us that this directive of President Reagan was, uh, was, was uh, you know, horrific and uh, unprecedented and no, clearly a break with, with uh, uh, you know, legal authority. And I believe that Chairman Witten said uh, to, uh, to Jim, and I'm sitting there next to him, is that there was no one in this town. There's no, I, I think this is what Chairman, you know, that's the, the way, the best I could make of it, because he was a famous mumbler, was that no one in this town will tell you that these earmarks are not absolutely binding, you know, on all executive agencies. And so, uh, you know, I, Jim looked over to me and, uh, 
I raised my hand meekly. There were just three of us in the room, as far as I can recall. Maybe, I think maybe there was a translator <laughs> for, for, who was there. But in any event, uh, so I raised my hand meekly, and I said, you know, Mr. Chairman, there's one person who thinks it's that. I really felt this was an opportunity, a profile in courage, and, and I'm sure I uh, was courageous in saying that, uh, you know, I, I felt that, uh, you know, unless it was passed into law and by, uh, you know, adopted by both chambers, signed by the president, uh, that, uh, in fact, it wasn't binding. Suffice it to say, and maybe the, the moral of yeah. this anecdote is that uh, individual members of Congress, especially if they're uh, long-standing chairs of appropriations committees, uh, can, uh, notwithstand this, notwithstanding the error of their way, notwithstanding the, the uh, correctness of the, the legal position of the executive and the president's uh, clear uh, and powerful uh, mandate not to comply with these earmarks, Congress has a way of achieving uh, its objectives, especially where spending is concerned. And um, I think that that memorandum survived uh, to a great extent on paper, uh, somewhat in practice, and I think that uh, I'm sure Chairman uh, Witten uh, mumbled uh, some words of uh, satisfaction at some point. But some progress was made, but in any event. Um, another uh, factor that I would observe is um, the, uh, and this goes to, uh, as follows on Jim's point about uh, when you're in an independent agency like the Federal Trade Commission, how you don't have the, the President and the, and the White House perhaps to help insulate you from uh, the uh, slings and arrows of Congress, be they individual members or, or otherwise. You're, you're, un you're on your own, as it were. Uh, I very much observe the difference in, uh, let's say, responsiveness to individual members of Congress. As I moved, uh, uh, Kathleen uh, talked about uh, the, some of the different positions that I held. I, I started out in White House Counsel's Office, which if there is a keeper of the flame of the unitary executive, along with Office of Legal Counsel, perhaps, in the Justice Department, the White House Counsel's Office is, uh, is the prime, uh, you know, uh, believer um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the unitary executive. So you're in there in White House Counsel's Office and you're saying to agencies, no, don't do that, don't give them that. You know, you can't do that. That's a violation of all that we hold dear and the, the future of the Republic hangs in the balance. And then, you know, I moved uh, uh, upstairs uh, from White House Counsel's Office to General Counsel of uh, Office of Management and Budget, still within the Executive Office of the President, but, you know, just a tick removed from, uh, from the, the White House office. And uh, you, you realize that, uh, you know, there's a lot going on. The agencies have to respond and provide uh, views and interact with, uh, with, with congressional committees as well as individual members, and, but you're still holding the line. You're saying, no, you can't do that. This is the president's prerogative. And so as general counsel of OMB, I would have opportunity to interact with, uh, uh, with uh, my counterparts at uh, agencies and, uh, and really, you know, counsel them, tutor them in the uh, in the philosophy of the unitary executive and, you know, Article Two and all executive power, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, um, but, but at OMB, you begin to start seeing how it's kind of a shared responsibility. Um, but, uh, you know, you, if, you, if you go too far in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, complying with, uh, with let's say, uh, excessive congressional requests, you're going to hear from, uh, from White House counsel. Uh, but by the same token, your job at OMB is to uh, propagate the, the president's agenda, ensure that the agencies uh, comply with it. Um, and then you go over, I was general counsel of the Department of Agriculture, you go over there and you realize, oh my God, the White House doesn't care as much about us, in many cases, except for some high profile issues, as individual members of Congress do. They're much more acutely focused, sometimes on, their, uh, on behalf of individual constituents, sometimes on behalf of particular policy issues, which a member of Congress has cornered the market on or uh, has a, a passion for. And, you know, you've got really nobody in the White House is, is, is interested in it. This member of Congress can make your, your life uh, difficult if you don't comply. Uh, so agencies are... Uh, you know, and so as general counsel of a, of a cabinet agency, we'd get these document requests, sometimes from a full committee, but sometimes from an individual member. Um, 
And you know, the White House counsel's office would say, hold the line. Don't, you know, don't provide that data. This is the president. You know, what's the authority? What's the legislative interest here? And um, your, your uh, policy clients at the agency are saying, you know, if you don't play ball here, uh, we're going you know, to pay for this. And so you've got to, um, you know, you've got, you've got to balance those, those different interests. Um, another point that I'll make is that the, the influence, uh, the outsized influence that um, individual members of Congress can have, and, and in this case, uh, I'm going to give a Senate and a, and a House example, uh, but it's over the individual. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, personnel or, 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 you know, personal factors or policy uh, and uh, the members of Congress are by no means, uh, you know, immune to that, that same calculus as, as anybody else. So uh, in the confirmation process, uh, senators, of course, can exert considerable inf influence and uh, a constraining, uh, you know, and constraint that, uh, that may carry on. Uh, you, uh, you, you have to satisfy, uh, you know, in your, in your courtesy visits or in your hearings or uh, in follow-up. Uh, the ability of senators to block the confirmation of individuals is a personal experience that I had where a, uh, a senator uh, on the uh, Agriculture Committee who was uh, uh, entertaining my, my nomination uh, took umbrage at a particular um, op-ed that I had written uh, while my confirmation was pending, which was a really stupid thing to do. Don't do that again. <laughs> and I, I, my, my wife uh, was, uh, at the time, uh, She's still my wife. She was serving at the time <laughs> as uh, the head of congressional affairs uh, at, a, uh, uh, at an agency. And uh, we uh, were in dispute about this particular issue our, ourselves. Uh, and um, so I snuck it into the mail to, to, to get it published without telling her. And when it was published, she says, you are out of your mind. Anyway, I was nearly not confirmed over this, but I had to spend uh, two hours abasing myself in front of the Senator in question, which was uh, not a, a uh, you know, it was not one of the noblest moments, uh, but but by the same token, the fact that uh, he deigned to give me that opportunity was something I was grateful for and, and never never really uh, forgot. Ultimately, it went through, and uh, you know, uh, you know, later I saw that senator uh, in a stairwell in the Senate, and he, if I'm you'll excuse this, uh, he, uh, so after asking me about how it was going at the department, then he taps me on the arm and he says, hey, that was fun, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and my, uh, and uh, so, uh, I, you know, I, I tried to uh, so you know, wangle as much a pride as I could and I said, uh, well, maybe, maybe for some of us. Uh, you know, interestingly, fast forward, I saw him a m number of years later uh, in a panel with a, another one of my former bosses, the White House counsel, A.B. Culverhouse, on the question of the, the nomination, the confirmation process, was it broken or not? And this particular senator said, I did some things as a freshman senator that I regret doing. And he looked out at me, and it was a small audience, uh, well, about this size. And uh, afterwards, he, he said to me, I'm glad I was able to get that off my chest. I really regretted <laughs> what we did. Anyway, one last example. Uh, uh, during uh, a, uh, before the, uh, the first uh, uh, Iraq uh, war, uh, the Department of Agriculture had uh, granted a billion dollars worth of uh, loans to Iraq for the purchase of, uh, of food and, and, and farm equipment, something which uh, speaking of the interests of individual uh, members of Congress, we got lots of letters during this, uh, you know, pre-Gulf War uh, time period from members of Congress saying, you must authorize these loans, you know, by this uh, you know, tractor manufacturing plant or this agricultural cooperative or something needs to get, you know, their $100 million sale through and you, it won't go through unless uh, USDA approves the, the loan. and. Uh, and so on. And so there was, uh, I think it was at least a billion dollars that was hanging in the balance at the time of uh, the first Gulf War, and uh, which uh, Saddam Hussein was uh, less enthusiastic about authorizing the repayments of these loans. And so uh, all of a sudden, all of these members of Congress who had been writing letters or making calls saying, you must approve these particular loans, and all of a sudden, they felt very differently about the wisdom of USDA uh, in, in, ex in, in extending a billion dollars worth of credit to, to Iraq. 
Um, and so I, I was up at a hearing, and uh, one uh, member of Congress, actually who had uh, asked the indulgence of the committee chair, I think it was the banking committee, uh, to participate, he was from North Carolina, uh, and uh, so he, he appeared as, a, I guess, a, a surrogate or ad hoc member of the committee and asked uh, questions at a prior panel about how the agency had, had failed to do a credit check on the Iraqi bank in question that was now declining to pay back a billion dollars. And I said, well, that seems odd. So I asked the, uh, the agency uh, representative who was accompanying me, I was testifying in the second panel, uh, is that right? And he said, I don't know, let me check. And uh, he comes back and he says, no, no, we have a credit check on the bank. I said, you know, this is another thing, you know, don't, uh, I advise, don't write op-eds while your confirmation is pending, and two, uh, don't do the following. So in any event, during my testimony, I said, um, and by the way, I would like to take this opportunity to correct a statement that was made earlier, that there was no credit check performed on the bank to which we lent a billion dollars. And, uh, and, and I said, in fact, there was a credit check done. It is in the file. In fact, during the break, I've had it brought up here. I have it at appropriate time. I'd be happy to share that. Don't do that. <laughs> and this is a case study if when you're a witness, you can't win a hearing. Don't try to win hearings. And OK, so the influence of the individual member of Congress who did not like being uh, corrected, maybe even uh, embarrassed, was that um, he took the opportunity uh, at, at subsequent hearings and opportunities of his to enter uh, statements in the uh, congressional record about, uh, uh, about myself, uh, which I declined to uh, enjoy reading. Uh, and so the moral of the story is that, uh, that uh, individual members of Congress have a, uh, they have their opportunities to make their views known. They are relatively unchecked uh, in their ability to, uh, yeah. uh, to uh, express themselves and to uh, have their uh, interests and, uh, and demands requited. So um, at the farther away you get from the, the, the core of the unitary executive, that is to say, you know, the, the, the White House itself, um, the uh, more you have to play ball with these requests, the more it behooves you to, uh, uh, let's say, not be, um, uh, you know, just not, not be aggressive in, in your resistance. And at the end of the day, I would submit that perhaps that's not such a bad thing. Uh, while we, we, you know, the executive power and here's in, in the president as it must and should under the Constitution. The fact is it is a shared responsibility. And so if there's a, a lesson uh, here is that uh, perhaps getting along uh, is, uh, you know, not a moral failure and can be a, uh, uh, an advantage in execution. Is that? Thanks so, uh, thanks so much. Um, I, I'm very honored to be here. I have to say, uh, a little surprised. <laughs> um, I appreciate, um, Kathleen, that you've guaranteed me safe passage. <laughs> um, it, I very much enjoyed listening, Jim and Alan, to each of you speak. Um, I, and I have to say, having um, been responding to congressional investigations as recently as February in the administration, and now currently conducting um, congressional oversight and investigations, uh, I think your observations are all right on point, totally timely, and um, completely in kind with my own experiences um, as recently as yesterday, for example. Um, I, um, I think that this is such an important subject for right now. We're, um, I think it's fair to say that we're in uh, interesting times, and Congress is right now um, very much currently grappling with these questions and trying to understand um, what its role is in this this era, and um, it's really unpredictable right now <laughs> from a perspective of a congressional staffer. Um, it's pretty disorienting. It's hard to stay on top of uh, the news cycle, w wondering if the um, the old rules and all, old expectations apply. And um, I think we're we're all trying to. Make, make sense of this dynamic. Um, and I think, you know, what, what you ended with, Alan, saying ultimately it's good, it's good to get along, um, I, I, I do think that's, that, that's really the an antidote to, um, to what we're experiencing. And in, in um, my 
career of conducting congressional investigations um, and, and oversight and trying to influence agencies, um, by far the most effective oversight that I've ever been a part of has always been the bi is bipartisan oversight. Uh, so I know that that's not a particularly surprising observation. Um, it can be hard to um, it can be hard to achieve, but it, it, I find that it's that it's always worth it. And um, for me, I, I look to the so I worked for Senator Levin on the permanent subcommittee on investigations for many years. We were, I, I worked in the minority and in the majority with many different Republican chairmen and ranking members. Um, all of whom we got along with and, and worked capably with conducting um, agency oversight. But um, I, one partnership on the committee that I think is worth noting is the, the Levin-Coburn era of um, the Subcommittee on Investigations because that's an example of two um, senators with very different ideological views of government and very different views on policy. And, they were an incredibly effective pair, um, in part because um, the, the general view of what, um, whether or not you agree with the size of the government, but everyone can agree in, on um, basic effectiveness, transparency, accountability, lack of waste, fraud and abuse, and on those principles, they worked hand in glove and their approach to even very politically sensitive topics, such as uh, the financial crisis and the causes and the um, effects of the financial crisis, the um, close cooperation between those members and their staff was based on the idea of what we can we can agree on the facts, and that's 99% of it. And mm -hmm. we might not agree on the recommendations. Um, the policy recommendations, but establishing that first 99% agreement on the facts, something we can do on a bipartisan basis, and that pr provides the predicate for good legislation, for effective oversight of agencies, of the rulemaking process. Um, so I, I continuously turn to that model, the Levin Cobra model, and that's something that I, in my new position I, I, I hope to achieve and, um, with Senator Peters and our chairman, Senator Rand. Senator Paul, um, so yeah, I, I, I appreciated your observations and I, um, I, I, I think they're on point. I also, um, Jim, you talked about some days it felt like you had 535 bosses and I, I've never held a position as lofty as yours, but in the, at the State Department, just as an investigations <coughs> counsel and advisor, um, there were absolutely days that I felt the same way. And, um, when we talk about the influence of individual members, um, you, you know, it, it is true that not all, not all members were equal, that um, powerful chairman had a way of getting our attention mm. the way that other members couldn't. Um, but there are different ways of getting attention, and, the, and the, if there were particular members that were extremely knowledgeable on specific issues that, um, you know, that the department cared about, the, the, that, that knowledge itself is a power to um, to interact in um, specific, less obvious ways on a daily basis creates its own sort of leverage. And I guess that's a, that's a point that I, I want to make. You, you know, Alan, you refer to um, the unitary executive in the White House, and that, that the view, and I often was in you know in, um, in receipt of advice from White House counsel and OLC, um, and their there is the theoretical framework that we all really care about that's expressed mostly in uh, terms of the um, rights and privileges between the, um, and the, the balance of power and, um, between, between the branches of government. Um, but in the trenches, in the day-to-day -day conversations with congressional staff members, um, it was not often productive to talk in terms of uh, rights and privileges to, uh, um, to uh, speak it, uh, on, in a theoretical basis, and that on a daily basis it was always about interests and leverage. Um, and um, it could often be counterproductive to explain why we, you know, we were reluctant to produce something, for example, um, on the 
pointing to a right or a privilege because that's the easiest way to challenge a, a chairman. A, a chairman who might not be in the details of every single policy issue is very jealous of his or her power um, and his, his or her rights to obtain that information. So um, we would, it was more effective to talk in terms of um, facilitating oversight and to, to negotiate um, in a specific detailed way. And, you know, it's, I think you'd agree with that. that that's something that was always pre, pre, appreciated, perspective was always appreciated by um, those, of, uh, those people who were giving us the instructions about, or advice rather, um, about the rights and privileges of the executive branch. Um, and I guess I would just comment on, on you made the, um, you gave the advice that you don't want to win a hearing as a witness. Um, and that's totally consistent with the advice I give both in my public practice and in the private sector, which was that uh, it's better to be boring than good. Um, and uh, another, in, with respect to preparing people for oversight hearings, there's often, in my experience, um, both in, in explaining to potential hearing witnesses the panels that they would be on and the topics, as well as representing people um, before congressional hearings, there's always a fear of a hearing um, witnesses of guilt by association. And in fact, the dynamic that plays out in a congressional hearing is um, much less often guilt by associ association than it is uh, exoneration by comparison. Um, so that I think that that's, uh, that's other advice that we provide hearing witnesses. I guess I make one more comment um, which is, again, in the trenches and can, when you're conducting or responding to congressional oversight, um, there, there, the importance of a relationship between individual staff members, staff members, uh, and um, the, between the, the legislative and, and executive branch, uh, you know, people that I uh, you know, don't share ideological views with, we are, uh, nonetheless, on a daily basis, when you're work, working closely together, you can build those relationships, you can have good faith, um, and it's important, it's very difficult to have trust in the, in Washington today and the dynamic that we're living in, but it, you can build it and it's so useful. And an example, um, I, Ellen, you point out there's a d distinguished uh, State Department legal advisor here. Um, something that I was proud of playing a role in at the State Department was the um, confirmation of Brian Egan as the legal advisor at the State Department. And, and as you may know, that, that, that confirmation was, that nomination was um, and held by Senator Grassley and delayed by Senator Grassley. And uh, for many legitimate concerns about um, compliance with congressional oversight. And um, over time, working with his staff, we were able to build trust with his staff such that Senator Grassley was comfortable um, releasing his hold, allowing the confirmation of Brian Egan as the legal advisor, even though we had not um, satisfied him, even though we had not, um, in his view, com um, entirely complied with his requests, but based on understanding that we were working in good faith and that we were genuinely working towards um, complying with his and participating, cooperating with good faith congressional oversight. So I guess I would just leave it there as an example of um, the, you know, that's a, a leverage dynamic, of course, with the whole process and um, an example of how good faith, good faith and participation, um, staff level relationships can, um, can, can function to, to have, I think, in many ways, effective oversight of agencies. That's great. Uh, thank you so much, Zach. Um, I have a, a very good um, comments by all of um, our panelists, and I think I uh, have a couple of um, general questions I'd still like to follow up on, as well as some specific ones that were highlighted in your in your comments. But I also want to encourage you all to, to jump in. Um, so if you hear something from Alan or Jim or Zach, you jump in if you want to comment on that. 
So I thought it was really interesting to hear the perspective that you were able to share very specifically about examples that you've had with, res with regard to um, engagement with, um, with specific members of, um, of Congress and their, in their relative oversight functions. I'm just kind of curious too, and this is something that Zach mentioned and I know was a, a focus of the plenary panel this morning, which is sort of Congress, what's Congress doing to reassert its power over agencies and this, this view of trying to, to sort of um, bring back um, more authority to, to Congress um, and, you know, with a view to quote, sort of reining in the, the administrative state. I wonder if you all have a view of whether or not there has been a change over the years in the nature, amount, or rigor of oversight by the Congress. Is that, is there anything, is that, has it been largely, again, a function of the membership and the leadership, the issues of the day? Does it have anything to do with the size and authority responsibility that, um, that the agencies have, have continued to assume over the years in terms of the amount of decisions that they take and the importance of those decisions, certainly more fundamentally on our, our economy and, and, um, and our life more generally? So sort of speaking to the amount of authority that Congress has continued to, this is more on the independent agency side, I suppose, but, but also in terms of the amount of authority that they continue to, to um, and discretion that they've given to agencies. Has that also affected, if at all, in your view, um, the, the nature of, um, of oversight? I guess from my perspective, I wouldn't say that there's a kind of a secular trend towards a greater or lesser oversight. I think it's uh, in uh, direct, uh, uh, you know, it's in, uh, it's, it's tied more towards whether Congress or one chamber of Congress is in the hands of a party that uh, differs from that of the administration. I think you can count on greater uh, oversight of uh, administrative agencies uh, if, uh, you know, if the, if, the, if the committees are chaired by members of a party different from, uh, from, from that uh, of the president, you know, and that's, uh, I guess, uh, you know, natural and understandable, uh, but uh, there's going to be more, what, what are the levers, and, uh, you know, I think that uh, Zach very um, astutely points out, you know, where, where's the leverage on, on different issues, and uh, so if you if, uh, a chamber uh, in the uh, opposition party uh, in, in, uh, doesn't have the ability to, uh, you know, get legislation uh, uh, signed because the president's of a different party, uh, then uh, they're going to uh, use the levers that they have, which is going to be oversight, which is going to be uh, trying to hold agencies, uh, which again are less able to insulate themselves uh, under the umbrella of the, uh, of the White House uh, uh, to you know, produce documents to uh, uh, explain, justify their uh, positions in the face of uh, hostile uh, questioning, certainly uh, intense questioning uh, often. Um, so, so I would say that uh, the degree of oversight is in uh, inverse uh, proportion to uh, whether there's a, uh, the, you know, the branches of government are in the same uh, political hands. Sure, I, um, I'd like to add to that. I, so I agree generally with that dynamic. I think that, um, but even within that dynamic, a lo the level of partisanship is important um, because there are other eras in Congress where um, there, there was less partisan rancor, more uh, cross-party cooperation, a greater moderate center, um, and that that creates a dynamic where you can continue to conduct good oversight whatever the, um, you know, the party in control. And I think one way of encouraging that um, is by empowering the minority party. So that's, I always took a Rawlsian view of how committee rules should be, how the Senate rules, and this is something easy for me to say now in the minority, but this is a position that I held in the majority as well. Um, and, and I think, again, PSI is a good example of this, which because of its unique history, has certain rules and protections um, that the minority at PSI is more empowered than perhaps any minority position or among the most empowered in the, in the Senate. And um, that's, that's true in the PSI's rules, but it's also true in the practices and the norms. And there have been, you know, committee members and staff who, um, who have really been committed to those practices and, uh, and norms. So for example, at this, sorry, PSI, the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, um, the, 
ranking member can initiate investigations. There's a practice that, um, that letters and subpoenas should be uh, supported by both parties, um, by both the chairman and the ranking member. And so uh, as a result of that, you know, when I worked for Senator Levin um, in a Democratic controlled chamber with a Democratic administration, we conducted bipartisan agency oversight with um, largely with Senator Paul. An example of that is we had an investigation into uh, DHS fusion centers that was not appreciated by the Department of Homeland Security. But um, Senator Coburn demonstrated the factual basis for that investigation and um, in part because of the institutional history of the subcommittee and the, uh, the bipartisan practices that were built into that subcommittee he had our full support, and it was an effective investigation as a result. Another example of that would be Senator Coleman's investigation into the United Nations Development Program in North Korea, which um, their, their, you know, Sen Senator, Co um, Senator Coleman had uh, views about the role of the UN and the US's support for the UN that were not consistent with Senator Levin's views, but with respect to strengthening the uh, US UN mission and building in um, firewalls against waste, fraud, and abuse of taxpayer money. There was a lot of effective, cooperative, bipartisan oversight on that issue. Yeah, Generally, I would agree what uh, has been said um, about the secular, I mean, the uh, time series, but I, and there are anecdotes on both sides in terms of evidence on both sides. But I would suggest two events affected the relationship of Congress vis-a-vis -vis the agencies, oversight of the agencies. One was the Watergate uh, and uh, investigation and the resignation of President Nixon, which emboldened Congress in terms of its authority, power over the executive. The second one, second was the 1994 election returns in which the House went Republican for the first time in over 40 years. And you had suddenly had a competitive House and in addition to an occasional competitive Senate. And it, the competition um, increased, on the one hand, increased the partisanship because each was fighting hard to maintain or to achieve majority status. Uh, but at the same time, they tended to direct uh, themselves toward finding fault with uh, the other side more than uh, exerting uh, power and authority over them. Again, this is sort of central tendencies, um, in my judgment, rather than a great break with the past. But I think I would discern two trends there. Could I make one other Please, uh, comment? There is some evidence that agencies perform, behave differently when they have before them decision-making of great particular interest to oversight committee chairman or members. Specifically, some work by Bob Tollison, the recently departed Bob Tollison and others found, for example, that the FTC, everything else equal, or economists say, et cetera, is paribus, that the FTC was less inclined to seek uh, an estoppel of a proposed merger when that merger involved the chairman or members of the Commerce Committee or Oversight Committees, other oversight committees. So there, that's an empirical test. Uh, it's not dramatic. It's not, it hasn't, uh, to my knowledge, been tested for a lot of other agencies, but in that one case, the, the result was pretty clear. That is a really interesting point in terms of that sort of empirically being demonstrated. I, I'm kind of curious because you would think that in the agencies 
um, mindset when they're looking at particular decisions? Do they take into account what the likely congressional impact or input is going to be? So certainly with respect to their, you know, their primary authorizing committees, whether it's leadership, the authorizing committee, or even appropriations, um, whether that goes into their calculation of, wh of whether or not it's likely to have any kind of um, uh, impact with them. But as a practical matter, you've got to think, how do you balance that, right, in terms of actually influencing whether or not you're bringing, in a Stavel case, or whether you're bringing particular kinds of actions that, as a practical matter, you'd question, is that really something that should matter if it influences this particular <laughs> member's district or a company in that company's, in, in that member's district or um, that, that senator's state? How do, you, how do you think about that? Did you all ever, how did you manage the, the sensitivity of key members' interest in still maintaining the integrity of, of the, um, the processes and the decisions that you had to take? Um, I, I would. I think the answer to your question is uh, yes, of course, uh, and that uh, it, one would be uh, ill-advised by uh, the, the head of congressional affairs at uh, the given agency, or even if you're, especially if you're in the White House and it's uh, White House uh, legislative affairs. I mean, they're, they're, they are going to tell you what the different members on both sides of the aisle uh, what their interests are, what, how, what the implications of a particular action might be, uh, how strongly they feel about it, uh, what leverage they might have. I mean, you know, that's the, di you know, that is the dynamic uh, in Washington. And I think maybe one of the themes here, uh, certainly a, a theme I would associate myself with, is that it's um, easy, uh, you know, to, to uh, you know, especially sometimes in the White, if you're a lawyer in the White House, if you're actually trying to get the legislation through and you're not, uh, you know, a constitutional lawyer in the White House, but if you're, uh, you, you have a different perspective, but it's easy to stand on principle and say, this is the president's prerogative, we'll make the decision here, and let's, you know, do, you know, that which is legally uh, required, do what's consistent with the president's policy, and uh, the rest be, you know, to attack with them. Uh, you know, that, that's just not the way it works. One learns, and I, I gave my own progression from, you know, being at the center the core of the, the, those who are the proponents of the unitary executive to, to moving to the outer circles, and you have to be more practical about it and can't stand uh, on principle. But, you know, certainly even in the White House, especially in the White House, uh, I would say, but in the agencies as well, your legislative affair, I mean, you've got to understand the dynamic where people are because... There are a lot of factors at play. Things are complicated. And uh, um, so the principle I would submit is important, the principle of, of the separation of powers, the principle of the respective roles and responsibilities. But the practicalities are important too. And you've got to take them into account, or otherwise you're, you're stymied. You won't get it through. You alienate one member of Congress here, and, and you, know, you may or may not be able to, to, to get past him or her uh, in this place, but it'll come back to bite you somewhere else. So it, it, you know, I hate to say it, but it's sort of a seamless web and you've got to balance it. And that's in essence what White House legislative affairs, agency congressional affairs, they, you know, they, they help you understand and take into account and depending on how important a, an issue is to the, to the uh, executive unit that's relevant, be it the, the White House, be it the agency, uh, you're going to stand on principle. Uh, you know, go, going back to, to, to the, the prior conversation about, uh, you know, document requests or whatever, a lot of times, you know, the White House is going to be saying, don't produce this document because it would violate our principle, uh, you know, of unitary executive or whatever. And then you're there in the agency and you say, there's nothing, you know, okay, the, I understand the principle. And, you know, if I were in, in the White House shoes, I would, I would certainly also propound it. But there's nothing sensitive about this. It's really the, you know, there's nothing riding on this other than this is a, you know, instance of adhering to the, the intransigently to the principle or not. So the point is that uh, intransigence uh, in, uh, you know, in, in politics and policy making and in execution of government 
uh, isn't uh, always a, uh, either desirable or workable. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to take into account individual members' concerns, uh, um, you know, uh, from both parties. Yeah. So, go ahead, Zach, did you have Sure. Yeah, um, so I, I entirely agree that um, the principle's important, the practicality is important, and um, I would just add to how, uh, how how I would sometimes think about that, you have an agency objective, and um, you're, it's a, it could be a good objective, one that you're committed to, uh, nonetheless, you have to do a cost-benefit analysis, because even if it's the right policy, um, there, and you, if you know that it will nonetheless incur a, a level of uh, congressional oversight, th that has, that takes a toll. I mean, that there are some good decisions that you can make that you know will cost thousands of man hours to explain and defend to Congress, and that can ultimately un undermine your mission. So um, I, I don't think there's anything, um, you know, inconsistent or improper taking those practicalities into account because you, at the end of the day, you're still committed to the overall objective and to the good policy, but you have to deal with the reality of um, achieving it and um, the. Uh, the cost of responding to congressional oversight, um, it, even good, even good faith oversight, um, that's something that has to be taken into consideration. Yeah, no, that was actually I was going to ask that because, in addition to the you know cost benefit um, analysis, perhaps that is required both with respect to sometimes in in the organic statutes, but also more broadly whether it's by you know. OIRA and the OMB Circula, or whether it's independent agencies also um, pursuing that. You also have the Administrative Procedures Act. So certainly when it's affecting rulemaking authorities, there is a process to that which, sort of touching on what Jim had said earlier about, surprisingly, that you know, when you get into quasi-judicial matters, you can see the sensitivity of you know, a particular member weighing in on trying to influence how a case was disposed of because of that na the nature of that. But when it has to do with rulemaking even, you do have um, you know, statutory requirements that the agencies are, 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 are following that in some ways give them some, uh, not shield, but, but some uh, uh, you know, protection from a you know, particular uh, you know, view being viewed, uh, view being um, in informing the decision making in a less than transparent way. If I might just add to that, um, an, an example of, I think, good congressional uh, influence over a rulemaking process, Senator Levin, if there was an issue that he cared about, um, we, he always wrote a comment letter. And, um, you know, that's obviously part of the process and totally transparent and appropriate, but uh, the agencies that we frequently dealt with um, knew no matter that Senator Levin would weigh in with a 50-page, exhaustively footnoted comment letter that um, his, his, some of his staff would, would work on for months and that um, there would be follow-up meetings and there might, down the road, be um, hearings presenting case studies of people impacted by the rulemaking. And so um, that was one way, totally consistent with the process, um, he, he, that he influenced it. And I think uh, that the agency response to that was to say, how might Senator Levin think about this role? And, um, you know, what, what concerns can we anticipate? Yeah. Go ahead, Jim, please. Uh, let me distinguish uh, two situations and just think of it. My being at the FTC, if you have before you a proposed merger, you want to ask yourself, is this merger a good thing or bad thing for the economy and consumers generally? Uh, if so, you want to say, we'll take a pass on opposing it. If it's bad, we'll say, we will object to it or fix it in some way. And you try to make the decision come out that way. That is to say, without considering the pressure that may be brought on you by members of Congress. Sometimes congressmen or senators will write a long letter giving a lot of data, a lot of information. You take that under consideration like anything else. That's very important information. But it's not because of who they are, it's what they have to say. It's very different if you're at OMB and you get a call from Congressional Affairs that says, 
Congressman X is willing to go along with the subcommittee's markup of the budget that so long as it contains this piece of pork. And we really need Congressman X's vote. She demands that be in there. Now, you might say, on the basis of principle, on the basis of the president's policies, that is really con a conflict. I mean, that doesn't fit at all. But you have to make the decision, is it better to have the congressman's vote or and risk that going down or not have the vote? And that is much more just a straightforward kind of benefit cost test. And it's not a violation of principle in the same, same way as it would be bending to the will of a member of Congress when your mind tells you that this should, merger should be opposed and a member of Congress is inveighing with you not to oppose it. So one other question um, with respect to developing relationships with Congress. Obviously, I think the key takeaway was basically you want to get along if you can. It's definitely in your interest. Um, as much as you can be responsive. Um, and Jim, you spoke about the, um, the importance of, you know, maintaining a relationship, I guess, with your primary regulators. You talked about, um, I guess it was, it was Dingle, mm -hmm. for example, when you had, you know, um, perhaps other members who were reaching out and asking for something, and you're like, look, we're not going to be able to do it, but maintaining that relationship with, with that committee chair to say, look, you, you're going to hear some unhappy members, but this is right. what we're doing. So keeping them apprised. So I'm kind of curious, you know, there are often instances where you have a, maybe it's not just sort of a niche issue, but a big issue that hits, and you've got everybody and their brother who wants to be, wants a piece of it. So you've got your primary committees of jurisdiction, and you've got every other member, you know, who, you know, who has an interest in, um, you know, meeting the interest of their, their constituency and, you know, being, looking like they're trying to do something. So how do you manage that? Um, as, an, as an agency, and Zach, I'd be curious from your perspective too, both on the executive side as well as in the Congress, in terms of the discipline around managing all of the, the myriad requests that are coming in, whether they're for documents or whether they're for, you know, coming up for hearings, you've got a bunch of different congressional, um, both houses, you know, seeking to, to have hearings. How do you manage through that, and how important is um, the question of the, the strength of the, um, you know, the, the, the key committee, key, key committees that are the, the primary overseers of the, the agencies and, and helping with that, if at all. Uh, so I think that's a, a, a really good question and, um, you know, I have a different perspective on that from the different yeah. seats I've had over the years, but, um, and, you know, it, at the Subcommittee on Investigations with Senator Levin, Frankly, we often played in banking committee space. And um, if I could just interrupt, I was the staff director of the banking committee, so it's sort of a loaded question for you at one point in time. We often played in banking committee space. And um, I think to a certain degree, um, knowledge is power. So there, Senator Levin was very knowledgeable about certain issues and could weigh in um, certain banking issues and you know, had enough of a jurisdictional hook through the Subcommittee on Investigations that um, he could contribute, he could be taken seriously on those topics. And at a staff level, um, you know, I'm thinking in particular of Elise Bean, who I think you know, um, became an expert in particular um, issues, whether it was related to uh, banking regulation or commodities. And so when the, when the push came, push came to shove and we're working on legislation and she could weigh in in a very knowledgeable way in those rooms where the staffers are negotiating, that she, it, she had to be taken seriously. And, and that Senator Levin would take those positions publicly. He had, he had to be taken seriously. So there was a, um, the, it was in the interest of the banking committee to bring them into the fold and to, to work with them. So um, on the other side of it, um, if those are, if, if those jurisdictional fights and those turf wars um, create fissures fr from 
well, oversight is being conducted, the agencies can exploit those fissures. So there were certainly um, mo you know, moments in my life responding to congressional <coughs> oversight that we were getting multiple requests on the same topic from different committees and some artful pushback, and you could have you know, committees asserting jurisdiction over other committees, and um, if the congressional oversight isn't to some degree coordinated or unified, um, agencies can exploit that. I want to actually open it up for questions because we're, we're moving right along on our schedule and if there aren't any particular questions, we'll continue to, to, to um, raise a few other points. But I'd open it up to the floor. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> the, um, I haven't Could been around a while. Can you the microphone I, as well? Is it on? Yeah. Is this on? I believe the, it is. The, um, I'm wondering, is it just being cynical, or, or do, you, do you guys feel that um, the Congress, members of Congress' main concerns the next re-election campaign, or next re-election, uh, above everything else, or is it just a function of the 24-7 news cycles that we live with now? Do you, it seems to me that, that, you know, if you read the history, even, you know, 30, 40 years ago, congressmen were... Um, more stood on principle and less worried about what, what the um, cable news was going to say about them. Can, can you, I wonder if you guys could comment on that. So, so and certainly that's a concern. Um, now, I, you know, I've been lucky in my career to work for people who believe that good policy makes good politics. And if you can find a member who holds that view, I would it, you, I recommend you work for one. <laughs> Um, and, but it does make a difference. I mean, you know, Senator Levin in there that I worked for him, um, that was a safe seat. So that provided a certain freedom that he, he could take um, positions that might seem unpopular uh, because he believed in the policy, but he could also take a longer term perspective. So um, it's, it, I think it's very valuable and a, you know, a structural challenge in our legislative branch, um, that <coughs> taking a long-term perspective is disincentivized. Um, so to the, to the extent there are members who can take that perspective, um, that provides for better oversight, certainly. I guess I, just to, to be uh, contrarian for the sake of uh, dialogue, uh, you know, a counter-argument, you, you mentioned, Zach, uh, uh, the, uh, the the, the um, having a safe seat and that allowing one perhaps uh, not to worry about the next election. Um, how many seats aren't safe these days? Um, and is, you know, it, does it turn out that that's a good thing or a bad thing uh, for a policy? Um, I think that uh, one of the phenomenon we see is that uh, the increasing partisanship of the districts that House members uh, serve uh, less, less a factor in, in states, perhaps, uh, for, for senators. Uh, uh, but um, the fact is that uh, we see a lot of uh, really uh, intransigent uh, commitment to policy now as a result of entrenched, safe members who uh, don't, don't need to worry about the other party at all, maybe need to wor worry about primaries from the right or, or from the left, and query whether you know whether that's good uh, or bad for um, you know for, for thoughtful policy. The point about the news cycle that you make, uh, notwithstanding wh whether or not a member is, is safely ensconced in his or her seat or not, they're all interested in raising uh, uh, funds and uh, to, to take advantage uh, of the news cycle for for, for headlines and funds and uh, so, so to use for fundraising purposes. That's uh, I think irresistible. Um, and uh, I think it would be fair to say, without being uh, excessively, uh, you know, a cynical, uh, that it, it's uh, a lot of oversight, uh, perhaps is, um, you know, in the nature of exploiting the news. And uh, I, I'm sure it's happened once or twice in the last decade that members will grandstand uh, on a certain issue that uh, where the uh, oversight is is just a, a a cloak over a desire to uh, you know uh, be in the news cycle oneself as a as a member. Uh, I, I take your point on the safe seats, um, but I, ultimately I think that does go point to the structural issue of 
um, and you raise it yourself, where someone is figuring a primary challenge and, and that creates perhaps um, more extreme, an incentive to take more extreme positions and we do get to the, the, a structural problem that points to um, gerrymandering and all sorts of um, you know, other larger um, dynamics that drive this. So, question? Regarding hearings, including confirmation hearings, we've heard, you know, don't try to win, don't bring up the truth if it would offend somebody. This is true. A lot of people refer to congressional hearings as kabuki theater these days. So my question is, is the process broken? Does it need to be fixed? Or is this a reflection of reality that we should just accept? If it does need to be fixed, what is the realistic goal and how could we get there? It's a tough question and a good one. Um, I, I sometimes uh, push back on the, the notion that the process is broken. Um, I, I, you might have caught me on a day where I'm not totally confident in pushing back. Um, but I do see on a daily basis staff members of every party and every ideological stripe um, working really hard to, you know, advance, advance some broadly shared principles about good government and democratic norms and um, avoiding waste, fraud, and abuse. So I, at the end of the day, um, you know, there's a lot that even the most ideologically opposed members of Congress and um, staff hold in common. I, I agree that the theater <coughs> portion of it incentivizes a focus on the discrepancies and exaggerates the discrepancies in worldview. Um, and of course, conflict makes for good television and that's problematic. Um, I am. I am sensitive to the accusation that a lot of congressional hearings are kabuki theater. I've certainly ex experienced that and, and have seen that. I think that um, one way to avoid, you know, a good model for avoid um, having real substantive hearings is when you're you are actually seeking information and you can go in with open questions as opposed to just presenting a narrative. And I think the most congressional um, investigative uh, hearings um, try to elucidate an issue as opposed to um, perform a, a predetermined uh, position. Another uh, factor to, you know, you, you can be right about its, uh, you know, it's uh, kabuki and not uh, necessarily the uh, uh, frank and full exchange of views and, uh, you know, communication and learning and so on on the part of the members. Uh, but even if that's all true, that doesn't make the process uh, either broken or worthless, right? Because uh, the hearing is, uh, in essence, a, a public tip of an iceberg. And there's more going on uh, besides what transpires at the hearing. Uh, there is the focusing of the mind of the agency in preparation. There's the, the same on the part of the members and the staff. They're the questions for the record, there's the follow-up. So in fact, there is more um, oversight and substantive exchange than one sees at the hearing itself, where members may even be walking in and out. There may never be critical mass of the members, the, you know, the members of the committee at any given time. But it doesn't necessarily, and, and, and the questions may really be uh, you know, statements rather than honest uh, uh, inquiry. But, the, but it really, it doesn't mean that the members are not genuinely interested, that the staff hasn't really probed the, 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 the issues at hand, that the agency isn't taking it seriously. It's just, uh, you know, going to, uh, you know, the point about being boring, I think that was, you know, you know just, just because a witness, you know, I mean, the same is true at a trial, by the way, you know, outside the uh, uh, political hearing context. You know, witnesses shouldn't be interesting, is for, for the most part. Uh, I mean, may be different in a high-profile criminal trial, a murder trial, whatever. But mostly, uh, but it doesn't mean that there is really isn't a substantive uh, exchange. Of, and whether Chief Judge Braden thinks that witnesses should be interesting in order to make uh, uh, her day uh, more uh, 
you know, more interesting. But, but I, I just would say that the fact that the process doesn't look like it is a cerebral, substantive uh, meeting of the minds and genuine grappling with the issues doesn't mean that it's broken. So, oh, did you have a comment? I just wanted to say that, um, following along the, those lines, if you go to a hearing and you're testifying and it's a crowd in the room, that's a bad sign <laughs> <laughs> because they're expecting fireworks. I have found almost universally that confirmation hearings and oversight hearings are unpleasant experiences because what makes a hearing is the opportunity for a member of Congress to do gotcha questions. And you can do all sorts of gotcha questions and get ink or get video clips from gotcha questions. And the, uh, and the incentive is so great, it's very hard for a member of Congress uh, not to take advantage of such opportunities. Um, it's the sort of thing you don't want your mother or father to watch, you know, because uh, they have some notion of who you are that's at a higher plane than what <laughs> is communicated in such a hearing. Um, I want to go back just a second. If I were at the FTC or similar agency and I had to turn down a demand from a member of oversight committee, or especially chairman of oversight committee, I would do what was right, but then, especially if I turned them down in a sense, I would call them, I'd give them a heads up. It's really important to give members of Congress a heads up. They hate being embarrassed because they, they're cons they want their constituencies to feel that they're in the loop and they're involved in these things. And it's much easier for a member of Congress to say, you know, I just heard from Jim, he called me and he told me they just couldn't go along with this, et cetera. I understand, I disagree, but I understand. That's much better than they're getting a call from the press that I, the FTC's just announced that, you know, that your demand is not going to be fulfilled. So again, a lot of this, a lot of this is how you handle it, not what, not, so, not, not um, well, let me put it different. You can do the right thing, and if you handle it well, uh, you won't be hurt. And in fact, in s some important ways, members of Congress, including those on the committee, will have higher respect for you afterward. That's a good point. Yes, sir. Hi, we heard a little bit earlier about what not to do um, in term, if you're a congressman, don't ask them to come in and have you resolve a dispute that's, uh, you know, under your investigation. But I'd ask each panelist to give me one quick example of what, is a, what has been the most effective way a congressman or senator has used a technique to persuade you to do something that, that they wanted you to do. I'm not looking for a name of a congressman or senator, but just the, 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 the approach that they used that was effective. You know, I, uh, Zach mentioned, uh, uh, gave some examples of uh, senators and members uh, with, and said knowledge is power. You know, if you, and uh, where a member actually has, a, a, you know, substantive knowledge about an issue, uh, and uh, he or she and his or her staff uh, can uh, communicate that, you know, their perspective and their knowledge like anything else, uh, you know, uh, agencies uh, should be uh, susceptible of persuasion. Uh, and uh, if the influence is uh, by virtue, even, even if ultimately uh, you don't agree with that member's uh, argument or position, if uh, he or she has knowledge that they share with you, uh, it can influence the outcome in a, you know, in a, in a better direction, even if it if the member is not satisfied that uh, the agency has adopted their, their position. So communicating knowledge and, uh, and submitting, uh, you know, either in writing or, or orally, yeah. uh, I, I think that can be very useful. Zach. Yeah, I, I would second that position. I, I, you know, I can think of examples where um, we spent years working on an issue, so if the 
was with respect to commodities trading, for example. We had people who de developed um, a public record over a series of hearings of um, you know, actual events that were taking place in the marketplace. Or, and this, this isn't as close to relate to agency oversight, but for example, Center 11 was con concerned about credit card practices. So we had a series of practice, uh, hearings over four years. We had uh, CRS reports, GAO reports, and, and then in, in fact directly solicited experiences from credit card holders and had thousands. And so when, then when we um, returned both to the industry and to regulators, we were, were speaking from a position where we could demonstrate um, specific behaviors we were concerned with and collaboratively propose solutions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Very briefly, I'm curious if any of the panelists can think of an example when an individual member of Congress has enjoyed outsized influence over an agency when he or she has not served on an oversight committee of that agency. Well, actually, I can think of one. Um, I know without, again, not specifically mentioning the member, but there, ha there was a circumstance. I used to be a commissioner at the SEC, um, and there, was, um, there were particular interests in high-frequency trading at the time, and you had a member, a member of the Senate who was very knowledgeable and was extremely focused on the issue. Um, part of it was because of his staffer's background, actually. Um, and so uh, the agency regularly received um, input from this member. And I would say, I don't know that it necessarily altered any, certainly any rulemaking um, or even the agenda, but it certainly did the focus because he got a lot of press. Um, he wasn't in a position to hold hearings or to do anything um, that significant in terms of you know, having the ability to to, um, to engage the agency in that kind of a public um, forum. But I do think that he was influential to the degree that, much as I think other members may be, um, where you know that they're gonna care about an issue, you know that if you're speaking on it or if you're testifying on it, it's something that you're gonna receive a letter from him on. So in many ways, I think, outsized to the degree that not being on the committee of jurisdiction but deciding to make this issue a particular one of focus, it did force the agency to be much more sensitive to the kinds of comments and the kinds of um, positions that he took in, in, um, in writing and uh, speaking publicly on, on the issue. Um, so I guess I use outsize in the sense of drawing the attention of the agency to, to that member rather than necessarily an outcome um, at, a, at a policy level. But I think that can be influential because you've become much more sensitized to the, the issues that they're raising, even if it doesn't alter ultimately what you do. Another, I mean, let it not go without saying that the leadership, uh, you know, uh, positions, even if not on committees of uh, jurisdiction, uh, is obviously also a, a basis for outside influence. Uh, another is, uh, you know, if there's a personal connection, uh, if, uh, you know, members of Congress are often uh, uh, exceedingly influential in placing personnel in uh, agencies. So that can be a factor. Now oftentimes the, the, it's related to the committee of jurisdiction on which they serve, but, uh, and, or leadership, but, but that's a factor as well, personal connection. So I would, I would also say yes to your question, and um, in addition to everything that's already been mentioned, add that another way members do this is through the press. So um, you can, um, just use, as a member of Congress, use your access to the media to um, create public pressure on an issue that you may not have any jurisdiction over um, or even knowledge about, but nonetheless create um, an environment where agencies are forced to respond. Yeah, just to follow up on that, it's a really interesting point, especially when you have sort of the marriage of the particular member and a reporter who wants to report on that. And so you're looking at news headlines regularly on, on the issue, so it's, it's a really good point. One additional thought is if, uh, you know, the, the media point suggests it, uh, is uh, if you, the member has a constituent who is not only directly affected by something but is 
so significantly so that it becomes a possible uh, you know, media story. Uh, so the, the member may not have committee responsibility, but has a constituent. The constituent is in the is or could be in the public eye over the issue, uh, and uh, you know they basically uh, uh, harness themselves, and you know one for their own uh, interests uh, for for positive publicity, but two because there's a constituent service element there that uh, gives them a uh, a role. Yeah, that's great. Well, I. Don't see any additional questions. Um, I want to thank the panel today. Um, hopefully, you've enjoyed the session, and uh, hope that you enjoy the rest of the um, of the conference today. Thank you so much for joining us.